develop some stuff, put some assets to the side, buy you some stock. Like he's he's into you right now. Get him to buy you some shares of stock that you're gonna hold on to and own. Maybe or maybe even maybe if you could, maybe if he's even willing to marry you, maybe you could do that. But I don't know because guys like him don't get married. But whatever, right? Like secure something that's gonna be yours. After he's finished with you, after he gets bored with you. And, and and I really, honestly, I know that's a crazy analogy, right? That seems like so, it's so detached and disconnected. But I feel like that's what we do as Black people. <clears throat> we become dependent on things that you should not depend on. We, we, we will be dependent on that job. We will become dependent on those fake civil rights. We will become dependent on that diversity, equity, and inclusion program. We will become dependent without understanding what it really takes to build something that is a bit more solid in the sense that you have not assessed the risk of what you're dealing with. You're making a deal with the devil, and you don't know that the devil's the devil. You make a deal with the devil, and you start trusting the devil as if the devil is an angel. And I think that we need to start listening to the Nation of Islam a little bit more because they've been telling you who the devil was for 75, 80 years, and we don't really listen. We don't understand that. Look, if you got to make a deal with the devil, you better make it temporary. And the whole time you're doing the deal with the devil, you better be preparing to secure your rights. What does that mean? Well, that means that if I got a good job, I'm going to turn that good job into some good wealth and some good assets. I'm going to go buy me some stock. I'm going to go get me some real estate. I'm going to go develop some infrastructure. I'm going to develop a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. You ain't going to have my family's financial security in, in, in the palm of your hand. If I have any sense that someone who hates me, pay attention now, if I have any belief that somebody who hates me controls the keys to my happiness, I'm going to take those keys out of your hand as soon as I possibly can. Because if you do not, if you do not have wealth in this country, you do not have freedom. Income does not make you free. Income makes you more of a slave. You're getting high on somebody else's supply. If you're gonna get high, get high on your own supply. You shouldn't even do that. But but if you're gonna get high, get high on your own supply. Don't get high on massive supply because massa can cut the supply off because massa becomes the connect. That's what happens when they don't train you properly on economics and what true financial security actually looks like. Let me keep going. So after Lord Dunmore offers uh, freedom and then takes it back, uh, nearly a century later in 1852, a second Emancipation Proclamation was drafted in response to Nat Turner's slave revolt. Turner's revolt shook the nation, especially the southern slaveholding states. Frightened by the successful slave revolt in Haiti, and Nat Turner's revolt in Virginia, many Southern slaveholders indicated a willingness to end Black enslavement and resettle Black slaves into Africa, Texas, or the Caribbean islands. So once again, they were offering you a chance to be free, but it wasn't out of the goodness of their heart. They weren't doing it because it's the right thing to do. They weren't doing it to be nice. They did it because they had to or because they were afraid. They did it because they knew that your freedom and your emotional reaction to the promise of freedom would become a significant bargaining chip in their political game of thrones. And, and this is a common thing. I want you to pay attention to how often things are offered to black people, not because they owe it, not because it's the right thing to do, but because somebody wants something from you. They need something or because they're afraid and they have to do something. That right there should, should tell you that, that, that it's not going to stick because they're not doing it for the right reason. Somebody who does something for you because it's truly the right thing to do and because they truly have your best interest at heart is very different from somebody who does something for you because they are scared. Nat Turner, rest his soul, scared the hell out of the slaveholders. The Haitian revolt scared the hell out of the slaveholders. So they were like, okay, you know, we'll give you freedom, but we need y'all to get the hell up out of here. We need to send you back to Africa, Texas, or the Caribbean islands. It says here, shortly thereafter, the mere thought. Now, here's again, just like Lord Dunmore, when they started really thinking about it, they said, whoa, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, we got to think about this. Shortly thereafter, the mere thought of over 4 million angry armed blacks in the street quickly galvanized Virginia legislators to offer 
what constituted a third Emancipation Proclamation that proposed simply to abolish slavery. So, so they okay, so this is interesting. So in 1852, they had a second Emancipation Proclamation in response to Nat Turner's revolt and what happened in Haiti. And then they offered a third Emancipation Proclamation, again, because they were afraid. They said, oh my God, what if you had 4 million angry armed black people in the street? Uh, let's just go ahead and propose an ab abolition of slavery. Ironically, nearly half of Virginia's legislators voted to abolish slavery in Virginia which is the birth, birthplace of black American slavery. They came just a few votes short of ending slavery and preventing the Civil War that followed. A few years later, 1863, after the Civil War had begun, President Abraham Lincoln reluctantly offered, reluctantly, that's an important word, thank you Dr. Anderson for putting that word in there, he reluctantly offered the well-known Fourth Emancipation Proclamation that did not free a single black slave. It did not free a single black, so not one single black person was freed from the Emancipation Proclamation. Even though it was symbolic, doesn't that word sound familiar? It was symbolic. It gave blacks some sense of hope. Isn't that another familiar word? Hope and symbolism. They don't do that anymore, do they? They don't use hope. They don't use any hope and symbolism anymore. Hope and change and symbolism. They, they don't do that anymore, do they? Even though it was symbolic, it gave blacks some sense of hope, which they recall annually on Juneteenth Day. Dr. Anderson hates Juneteenth, by the way. I just want you to know that he has a big problem with Juneteenth. Contrary to what so many blacks believe, Abraham Lincoln signed the well-known Emancipation Proclamation in an effort to save the Union, but not out of love or compassion for black slaves. So he did not do it because he loved black people. He did not do it because it was the right thing to do. He did it because he knew he could hurt the South, and he knew that that was the only way to save the Union. Lincoln's proclama proclamation was a propaganda ploy to lift the spirits of tired Union soldiers as well as expected blacks. The proclamation announced that all persons held as slaves within any state in rebellion against the United States, not all the states, just the states where they were in rebellion, were henceforth and forever free. So he had no power to even enforce that because at the time the South was what the South was uh was fighting against the North anyway. The South was rebelling. So so his words didn't have any power in the South, by the way. President Lincoln had no control over the rebelling southern states, that's what I just said, and no constitutional authority to abolish slavery in the loyal states. So he couldn't, he couldn't even he couldn't not only could he not do it in the states that were rebelling, he couldn't even do it in the states that were under his control. So he was just talking. He was just talking. Consequently, black slaves actually had to wait until the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution before they gained some quasi-freedom. Quasi-freedom is an important word. Quasi-freedom is not the same as real freedom. Quasi-freedom is, okay, you've kind of got this monkey off your back a little bit. You're not legally constrained by slavery anymore. However, you're kind of like our 17-year-old daughter where we told her you can technically go to the mall if you want to. You can technically go to the movies if you want to. But we know that you're not going to be able to go because you ain't got no money and you ain't got no car. So, so, so when you don't have uh, the economics to support, sustain, and defend your freedom, then you don't have freedom at all. If you ever get up and go to work and you say, gosh, I hate going to work, and somebody says, well, if you hate going to work, then why would you do it? You might want to slap that person because you're going to be thinking to yourself, of course, I have to go to work because if I don't go to work, I'm going to be broke. So I do have a choice, but my choice is either to do this terrible job or to not be able to pay my bills. I got to do the job because I got to pay my bills. So without the economics, then you have no freedom. The economics defend your freedom. But also remember, in financial consciousness training, we've been going through my book. My book is called The Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power. You can get a copy at drboycebooks.com. And you can even buy them in bulk at a discount if you want. If you want to sell them to other people and make money for yourself, you're certainly welcome to do that.